Okay, and, and there was a new category that we had uh, identified this year in particular. It's, it's called misconduct, misbehavior or inappropriate behavior of employees. So it's more related to, to internal or insider cases where senior employees or even management gets involved in improper behavior in order to, to yeah, generate some advantages that not necessarily are to steal immediately money out of the company, mm -hmm. but that generate some indirect profits or benefits on the longer term. Is, is that something that, that you would also classify as dangerous? Because the, the statistic says there it's relatively low in appearance, but uh, I would link that uh, normally to, to the higher uh, value damage cases in the end. I, I think there's two categories within that category. Let me start with the easy one, which I think is not as dangerous, is not as risky. For example, you have a legitimate businessman who's running a small business, but his bills uh, are large for one month and, and funds are tight. And so rather than paying his employment taxes for that particular month, he waits and he says, I'll double it next month. He has no intention of actually cheating the system. He uh, really intends to pay those mm -hmm. funds. But maybe next month doesn't pay off as well as he thought it would, and he can't make the payments. And then the next thing you know, you have this snowball building. Mm. Um, I, I used to see that a lot um, when I was at the FBI, where um, they really, their activities had good intentions. They had no criminal intent at all, but ultimately they commit crimes in the process. I don't view those as um, significant or severe as the second category. In the second category, you see conduct, for example, where uh, people will sort of manipulate numbers or a system. Maybe it's for promotion or for a bonus or for uh, competitive reasons to, to get to a point faster than they should. Those, I think, are much more significant, especially when it's financially related. Sometimes it's indirectly financially related, for example, through bonuses and performance uh, mm -hmm. payments. Those, I think, are the more severe ones. Those are the ones that deserve more attention in an investigation. And those are the ones that businesses need to look out for even more. Yeah, OK, I see. Yeah, no, I would agree that that's the cases that, in our experience, also typically tend to create the, uh, the biggest problems for organizations. Absolutely. Not the least with regulators. Often. Absolutely. And sometimes those, the, the results of those aren't, aren't found for years. Sometimes it takes months or years before ultimately the problems occur from the activities that uh, originated the, you know, the issues. Yeah, okay. Um, I have a special one about offshore business, offshore structures. Um, I mean, in, in your view, is, is that crucial for uh, grand scale money laundering cases to, to use offshore structures? Or um, what, what would be the impact of those uh, very strong regulatory trends that we have in particular in Europe with regards to transparency? Some even would quote it over transparency. Is that something that will stop these type of uh, issues or uh, what do you think about it? Well, let me address transparency first. I think that's a good concept. I think transparency is good. I don't think there is a thing such as over transparency. Um, I can understand, uh, for example, if I may illustrate an example. When, when Walt Disney was going to build Disney, Disneyland in the United States, he needed to buy up great volumes of land. And had the landowners known at the time that it was Walt Disney that was seeking to purchase all of this land, um, they would have charged more for that land. Mm -hmm. So in his case, he used different companies to purchase the land, people not knowing. So an argument could be made, well, he wasn't very transparent there. But the argument could also be made, is that really a business issue or a a money laundering issue, well, certainly it has nothing to do with money laundering. Transparency, I think, overall is good. As far as offshore centers, is it absolutely necessary for large-scale money laundering? No. In fact, I think um, significant amounts of money laundering occur having nothing at all to do with offshore jurisdictions. I think it's important to remember there are two different concepts. There's evasion and avoid avoidance. Avoiding taxes, for example, is not a problem evading your taxes, not paying them when they're due or when they're owed, that's the problem. Using an existing structure, as long as it's legal, um, to avoid uh, the amount of taxes that you'll pay, to me, is a legitimate 
investment and, and uh, uh, business planning strategy. Uh, I think those concepts are important. I think what happens here is movies and books and folklore comes into play. And many offshore financial jurisdictions used the reputation as a way of gathering business in the past. And I think that has, has, has stuck, it's, it's maintained itself. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there are hundreds of billions of dollars laundered each year having nothing to do with offshore financial centers. Okay. Um, so I don't think it's absolutely required, not by any yeah. stretch of the imagination. Yeah, indeed, I understand. So it's it's maybe uh, supporting or helping some of uh, larger schemes, but in, but in the no, end, there's a no lot doubt there are there are a number of uh, money laundering operations that clearly seek to use offshore jurisdictions. It occurs. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it has occurred in the past. It will occur in the future. It is getting better worldwide, I think. Does it still occur? Absolutely. Mm. There's no question about it. Yeah, sure so it indeed, yeah, you can have money laundering without touching any uh, exotic islands. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing about money laundering are there's really two different kinds of money laundering. One is self-laundering, where you take the proceeds of a crime that you may have committed and conduct some type of financial transaction. What people often forget, though, is there are third-party money launderers who their entire business is to launder the proceeds of somebody else's crime. They have no involvement in the underlying crime, only in the laundering of the proceeds mm -hmm. from that crime. And it's sort of unique to money laundering. There, I don't, I'm not aware of really any other statute or crime that has that kind of breakdown where you can do it yourself or you can actually pay somebody else to do it. Yeah, it's an interesting business model indeed. <laughs> yeah, very much so.